A lot of Canadians seem to be screaming at each other these days. In fact, a recent poll suggests over a quarter of us view people who don't vote like us as enemies. It feels like we're all being asked to pick a side, and often that's about immigration. We saw it with Brexit, and we see it with Donald Trump. And now that same debate is getting a lot louder here. But here's the thing. Part of the battle is being driven by misinformation, by fake news, but also by a web of conspiracy theories that are changing the way voters see the world. And as we saw with Brexit and Trump, you don't need much to shift the vote. It's become such an issue in our politics that this week, Elections Canada announced it will deploy misinformation teams to monitor social media during this fall's election. In just a few minutes, I'm going to talk to Christopher Wiley. I've been trying to get an interview with him forever. Remember him? Cambridge Analytica is the canary in the coal mine. We must address the digital echo chambers that are being exploited to algorithmically segregate American society. That's Wiley testifying before the U.S. Senate. He's the Canadian data analyst turned whistleblower who helped develop a psychological warfare machine with Steve Bannon. They set up Cambridge Analytica, got a hold of the data of 87 million Facebook users, and used it to manipulate people to vote yes in the Brexit referendum, and then to help make Donald Trump president. So how exactly did they do this? Well, get this, Wiley says a key ingredient was finding people who are open to conspiracy theories and then targeting them with more lies. But how does that affect Canadian politics? Let's take a look at one conspiracy theory being spread here. It's about Sharia law, an Islamic code derived from the Koran, which touches everything from rules on praying to how crimes should be punished. If you punch in Sharia law on YouTube, lots of conspiracy theories pop up like, like this. Canada officially accepts Sharia law or no-go zones are coming to the West. These would be zones where non-Muslims supposedly aren't allowed and Sharia law prevails. So what's the truth here? One province, Ontario, has authorized the use of Sharia law in some civil cases like divorce. It works like similar tribunals for Catholic and Jewish families, but Sharia law does not exist in Canadian criminal courts at all. But that's not what some people believe. Check out this protest video posted on YouTube. I thought Muslims, everybody's welcome here if they assimilate, but now that I know better, yeah. Um, I'm very scared who we let in. Mississauga has a great majority of Islam, uh, Islamic people and they're voting for their laws to come into our country. Right now, they're trying to be, uh, they're trying to be quiet about um, what they're doing and they're very sneaky at it. This idea that Sharia law is taking over has spread like wildfire across Europe, across North America. Several states have even passed legislation to preemptively ban it. When the Liberals passed an anti-Islamophobia motion two years ago, some spun it as Trudeau opening the door to Sharia. He was confronted about it at a recent town hall. The people are saying no, because they're, these two cultures will not mix. Which two cultures are those, sir? Islam and Christianity. No, 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 sorry, sorry. okay, hang on. Thank you for, for sharing your concerns, sir. I've got one other thing I want to say about it, okay. is that they've openly sta stated that they want to kill us. Okay, okay. okay. And you're letting them in. Okay. Um, sir, Canada is a country that was built by immigration. It gets even more intense in some underground chat rooms. There was an investigation by the Globe and Mail recently that uncovered over 150,000 messages from one far-right forum called Canadian Super Players. We got our hands on some screenshots showing members who, along with denying the Holocaust, also push Sharia law conspiracy theories. One writes, don't you know Sharia is already officially government approved? Another says, build a wall, limit Muslim immigration. The members frequently argue Canada must prevent what they call white genocide. They also, these members, they wrote letters to Andrew Scheer and other conservative politicians encouraging them to get stricter on immigration. And where does Scheer stand on this? Well, all he says is that Trudeau needs to crack down. 
This is about having the integrity of our border secured, not just for the sake of having a secure border, but to make sure that we can have an immigration system that prioritizes those who come to Canada the right way. To be really clear here, it is not the political parties spreading these conspiracy theories. It's often hostile foreign actors, some third party groups looking to sway opinion or sometimes just make money. But as these ideas spread, the pressure on politicians builds and some are more responsive than others. If you are, I don't know, pro uh, Sharia law, that's against our values. If you want to impose a new rule of law, Sharia law, uh, the integration won't be very well in our society. Joining me from London to talk about all of this is Christopher Wiley. Um, so, Christopher, great to talk to you. Um, you've been inside this machine. You helped create it. Can you give me more of an exact idea of how this actually works? Say I'm a group that wants to micro-target people, uh, to move them slightly. How exactly would that work? you know, companies like Cambridge Analytica and what the alt-right have been doing is trying to seek out people who are more prone to believing in conspiracy theories. Um, and so those people uh, have a very particular kind of profile um, and those people are usually targeted uh, initially with ads, um, but as soon as they, you know, join a group or a, a forum or start going down a website, they get engaged and, and you know, over time, uh, you know, drawn down a, a rabbit hole of, of conspiratorial thinking. And this is something that, you know, Cambridge Analytica, Steve Bannon, the alt-right, and even Russia have realized that, that you know, a, a flaw in our democracy, uh, you, know, but, you know, or just a, a, a feature, a function of our democracy, is that um, if you get a small group of radicalized people out and engaged in a really tight race, you can win that race. Uh, and so that's, that's currently what's being exploited. Right now, a huge issue here, everywhere, is immigration. So you could use it to influence people on that issue? You could, any issue that you want, you can find people that probably would engage with it. Um, immigration is one that often is used because it has to do with how we see ourselves, how we see society, and how we see others. Um, and so in, in that case, you know, race and ethnicity, um, you know, and, and, and the notion of otherness is a, is a very intimate, uh, intimate thing that plays into how people see themselves and their identity. Uh, and, in that, and in that way, you can get people really uh, emotionally captivated by, by messaging. So we do have an election coming in the fall. If, uh, like, what should Canadians be watching for? I mean, if you were a political party or a political force right now, what would you be doing? How would you be trying to use data to influence voters? Using data for targeting in elections is not new, and something that I, you know, should make really clear is that um, there are legitimate uses of of data and targeting in in elections. You know, with, you know, you know, growing disengagement, particularly amongst young people, um, and the growing sort of noise of the you know, internet and, and media environment that we have. Um, political parties really do have to up their game to make sure that, you know, when they communicate a policy or they communicate a message that is relevant to voters that they want to speak to. And that's, that's pretty fundamental to, you know, uh, the notion of democracy, that politicians speak about things that people care about. But there is a line, and that line gets crossed when, um, you know, you move from talking about relevant issues, uh, you know, for our country to, um, you know, invasion of privacy, manipulation and, and, and deception. I don't think that any of the mainstream political parties in Canada, you know, are out to intend on, you know, deceiving or manipulating voters. Um, but I think there are threat actors, um, you know, at play in Canada, like most other Western nations right now. Um, and, and so I think the, the, the real threats are, are not necessarily from mainstream political parties, but actually from, you know, the, the growing uh, alt-right and also from hostile foreign states uh, like Russia. I think Canada in particular is at risk for um, both hostile foreign interference in the upcoming election, but, you know, also from the growing ethno-nationalism and alt-right that we see in the United States is, is starting to bubble up into Canada also. In the last few months, the Canadian government has announced measures to try and, you know, crack down on what can be allowed on social media, what political parties are allowed to do. So there are guidelines, restrictions on, on what political parties can do does, uh, in terms of targeting people. Does that reassure you? Can they? No, it doesn't, because I don't think that what, 
you know, mainstream political parties are doing in Canada is the problem. I think it's actually, you know, a lot of these organizations that aren't, you know, officially regulated, that aren't, you know, political parties, um, alt-right groups, and also, you know, Russia, right? Russia doesn't care what is legal or not legal or what, you know, the Canadian government's guidelines are for social media. Uh, because it, it is seeking to undermine, you know, the cohesiveness of Western democracy around the world. How, how would you fix this? I would fix it by first, you know, starting to actually create rules that, you know, the technology sector will start paying attention to. You know, in late May, um, legislators uh, from parliamentary committees all around the world are coming to Ottawa, actually, um, to actually start talking about how can there be, um, you know, a common international framework of rules uh, to take on big tech, um, and, and that's actually being hosted at the Canadian Parliament. Uh, Canada is playing, a, a, you know, a significant role in that, in the Ethics and Privacy Committee, um, and I think that's a, a good first step. Actually, taking a step back and going, one of the reasons why these big tech companies can get around the rules is because there is no common framework of rules, um, and the internet is innately international, and that we probably will need some kind of international coordination and cooperation between countries, particularly small and mid-sized countries, to actually collectively uh, exert pressure and, and uh, economic and legislative force uh, against big tech in Silicon Valley. Last time we saw you, you had blazing pink hair. What, what color is, is that? <laughs> Uh, I, I think I'm going to call it highlighter yellow. It kind of glows <laughs> in the dark sometimes, so it, 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 dep it depends on the, on the lighting. Right now it kind of looks a bit yellow. Christopher, wonderful to talk to you. Thank you so much for talking to me. Thanks for having me.